thinks about a, an area or a, a hat, an event in the history of Boone County, who could we get to talk about it? And your name, you know more than anybody. Well, your name always comes up. That's only because I've lived that long. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, for whatever reason, uh, Bruce is going to share with us about Whitehaven. All right, thank you very much, Ann. And uh, I will do stand up as long as I can. <laughs> and then I'll end up sitting down. I'll move around here a bit. And I do have, uh, it would be nice for you to know what we're talking about. Uh, do you mind? I, 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 we're going to do a bit of audience participation here, and I'm going to involve the audience. but. Uh, a show of hands of how many people in their lifetime remember seeing White Haven? All right. Uh, we are fortunate, are we not, that it was such a magnificent structure. I mean, uh, it was so imposing. It was directly across the road from my father and mother's house. And uh, I was so impressed by it uh, as a youngster and had the opportunity to visit there often. And, uh, <clears throat> I was, circumstances bode well for me in the fact that uh, in the mid-30s, during the desperate depression years, it was purchased by Dan Fries, who had Fries Jail Works in Ludlow. And uh, the only thing that was successful during the depression were jail manufacturers, I believe. <laughs> the Stewart Iron Works and Fries did quite well during during the 30s. Uh, and this is the house under its construction period. Uh, this is Hazel Freeze, the lady standing there. From the original small photo, I was hoping it would be her mother, but as this was enlarged, I believe this is Hazel Freeze's sister, who is Frida Burnt, who had been married to, to the sheriff of Kenton County with the nickname Walt Burnt. I mean, uh, that was his name. Uh, Jack will understand that that was the name of uh, for the sheriff. Uh, be that as it may, Hazel Freeze, her husband, Dan Freeze, quite wealthy man, bought the house from Lynn <coughs> Frazier. And this was the remodeling process. Uh, and uh, these, these photos will remain up here for your examination as the evening progresses. Uh, this unusual building and I'm so pleased that the, uh, the photo of this exists because this was the octagonal ice house and part of our evening program will involve my reading a story that my mother prepared for the Boone County Historical Society in 1955 uh, and had me present it at the meeting which took place in the old town hall <laughs> in Florence another structure that should not have been abolished and torn down, as Whitehaven was torn down. We'll get into that as we go along. Uh, and to find, to give you background before I go into my mother's uh, historical novel, to, to make sure you can understand what Whitehaven was, and we will really try to go into as much of its true history as possible. But this from the Union book, A Peek Into the Past. <clears throat> but uh, uh, Ann Fillmore borrowed from the Boone County Recorder an article that my mother did for the Boone County Recorder in 1955, which was to complement the program that was given before the Historical Society on that same date. I'm going to read this. Uh, very brief. The Whitehaven Academy was a boarding school in the 1800s, located in Union, where Don Rat Conrad's home is now. It was founded by Reverend W. G. White, who was the pastor of the Richwood Presbyterian Church during the 1860s. We have Reverend White's picture up here for you to observe, the gratis of Ruth Wade Cox Broodings, who preached at Richwood. Uh, Whitehaven was described as being built in the gingerbread era of design with six square columns that held up double porches topped with scrolls and figurine, filigree. 
The structure was a white clapboard with green shutters and wide verandas reaching across the front on both the first and second floors. A white railing ran around the second floor extension. The massive front door was glass, so <clears throat> paneled on both sides. The building sat on 80 acres of land and featured servants' quarters, a carriage house, a stable, and a root cellar. After closing as an academy, it was used as a private residence by several families, such as the Dugans, J.M. mentioned them, uh, Lynn Frazier, and Dan Fries bought the property from the estate of Lynn Frazier, and Doc Edwards. And let me say, Lynn Frazier was the cashier of the Union Bank, one of the most respected men in the Union community. And my mother's name was Shirley Lynn Rice, after Mr. Lynn Frazier. He was, he was the sort of man in a community you named your children for. I mean, he was that well thought of. And he owned White Haven before it was taken over by Dan Fries, and eventually by Doc Edwards, who gets credit during his ownership of having destroyed the place. Uh, mm -hmm. When the Connor, and no disregard to Doc Edwards, I mean, we got, we went through a period of Boone County's history where we destroyed everything that was old and not useful anymore. My golly, it's getting old, let's tear it down. Uh, and when the Conrads bought the property, they built a new modern home to replace the old structure. New Haven was named after White Haven and placed so it would be between Beaver Lake and Union. And when New Haven, who brought that up? Did you, Ruth Wade or with others? There was a dispute over where to locate the new school Mary, uh, Kathleen did. And that was, it. so they had to compromise on the, the public school at Beaver and the public school at Union, and that was supposed to be halfway in between. And uh, so that's a brief description. There is more stuff. But now, if you will allow me, and before I venture into the novel, three page, very short, that my mother wrote, uh, she was a, such a talented lady, uh, and especially in writing, to the point that she was so good at it, I never even tried. <laughs> I, I, I just abandoned. My brother, he does a decent job, but I refuse to try because uh, she was so good. But uh, preserving this material, let me mention uh, the as we all live this short span on this earth, the persons who, to me, will always deserve credit for preserving the record most diligently, I will start with uh, John Euro Lloyd, fantastic historian to preserving the past of Boone County, and then William Conrad, and, and William and Ann Fitzgerald. Uh, I, William and Ann were 18. I mean, he gets the credit by George that <laughs> Ann was tremendous. Uh, but those three people, well, I thank the Lord that we had those people in our community preserving the past because so much would have been lost without them. Now, if you will please tolerate me, I'm going to read as best I can uh, what Shirley Rice Ferguson wrote in 1955 for the old Boone County Historical Society, headed by William Fitzgerald, William Conrad, Florence Brothers, uh, uh, Goodrich, Elizabeth Dell, uh, oh, I, I'm just trying to recall from memory, the wonderful people that kept uh, that, uh, this society alive at that time. And then, of course, Boone County Historical Society went to, to a period of lapse. But at that time, can you imagine the delight of meeting in the old town hall? Oh, it was such memories. Yes, mate, here we go. The White Haven Story by Shirley Rice Ferguson. Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States, Beriah McGoffin was governor of Kentucky, and John C. Breckinridge had just resigned his seat in the Senate at Washington when Ephraim and Tom made their way along the gravel road to their new home. The whistle of the steamer, telegraph number three, still rang in their ears as she blew for a landing, for the landing at Hamilton in Boone County, Kentucky, depositing these three young charges to the fate of a five-mile walk. What was just a giant rumble some 15 years before when Cassius Marcellus Clay published in his Lexington paper, The True American, 
advocating freedom of the slaves had now developed into a loud roar, and the smell of gunpowder on the south wind was not unbounded. But to those two little darkies, this was of small consequence. They had a good master, Mr. George Wynn of Louisville, who was loaning them out for a year from his large holding of slaves. Glancing up from their childish pleasures of kicking dust and leaf rustling, they saw through the cloud of dust a stagecoach make the turn off of the Union Beaver Road. The four horses started to slow up, sensing they were nearing a breathing place, and the driver pulled them to a full stop at White Haven Academy. Surely the one who described the Queen of the West loved the river. At first sight, one felt a giant steamer was at anchor in a green sea. This was the gingerboard era of design, and six square columns that held the porch, double porches were topped with scroll and filigree. The structure was a white clapboard, green shuttered with wide verandas reaching across the front on both the first and second floor. A white railing was around the second floor extension. From the massive front door, glass paneled on each side, came Mr. Cotton, uh, who bid welcome to the students of the academy for the fall term of learning. The first down from the stage was Shelley Moffat, having made the trip from Independence, and right behind him was Eve Norman from Walton. The Kendall boys had taken the Kentucky Lexington Railroad from Williamstown, were it much in evidence with their grimy faces from the long journey. Eve and Tom, quick to remember their training, started toting valises and catch balls and trunks into the wide hall. Each room entered on the hall, three being on one side, two on the other. The stairwell taking the space of the balancing room. The, stores were, st the stairs were broad and of walnut, curving to a landing and on the second floor. On this level, there were the same number of rooms, except the, the two small rooms at the rear, which were fashioned into a bathroom and a prim room. All had their own fireplaces, the windows from ceiling to floor, and wide woodwork decorated each. Mr. Cotton showed the boys into the parlor, and with some misgivings told them that due to the large enrollment of young ladies, some of them would have to board out for the term. Mr. Addison Huey had offered to take some of the lads to his farm and home about a half a mile from the main road. Plans were made for their departure, but first Mr. Cotton wanted to give them their numbers. As was the custom, each student was known by his number, and it was remembered hearing the number 176 being called in classes of geometry, higher mathematics, and algebra. By this time, Eve and Tom had found the kitchen by following their noses, no doubt, because their old Mammy Mary was boiling up a mess of late beans and hog jowl fresh from the garden in the smokehouse that very morning. This section of the building was attached to the main part, but with separate entrance. The kitchen went the entire length of the first level, at the far end being the narrow stair leading to the second floor where the ceiling was low, the windows being quarter-sized, swinging out on hinges. This was the servants' quarters. Mammy Mary showed the boys corn shuck husk pallets, patted each on his kinky head as she asked them about their folks down at the Falls City. She never gave hope of someday finding her loved ones again. The boys wanted to pounce down on the shucks, but Mammy Mary said there was no time for such foolishness and showed them down the steps to go fetch wood chunks for her cook stove. They walked out into the brick courtyard, which tied the main structure with the quarters in the center, of which was an old wellhead, its windlass and rope and wooden bucket. They soon <coughs> forgot the wood assignment when they, went, when they saw the perfect place for sliding the top of the cellar room. At the very top was an air vent, which was so important to the potatoes and pumpkins and other root vegetables during long winters. Eve and Tom were having a merry time, each on a board, sliding down the packed earth mound until they saw something in some distance away, a large white stable. That they must see, and rushing off into the distance, they came within the pungent odors of leather, horses, and oxen oil. 
Let wooden pegs on a straight line around one wall were heavy with harness, bridles, and crop sticks. And then they met Uncle Paul. The gray was just a fringe around his old black head, but his voice was cheerful and soft. He was rushing down one of the riding horses, making ready for the boys who would be wait wanting to see the South Forty. Or maybe ride into the woods or anywhere that they took their fancy, for there were 80 acres over which to roam. Uncle Paul straightened up the fact that Mammy Mary was his woman. He also straightened them out that they were to help his children brighten the brass on the harness, to use the oil to make it soft, curry the horses, and carry the water. So many other chores were being mentioned, they thought it might be best to take a look at the building across the path, which they did. They found this to be the carriage house. Mr. Cotton Surrey, the tongue resting high against the back wall, was all black with bright red spokes. The whip holder was a bit worn, but the fringe around the top seemed as new as it rippled with the slightest gust of wind as they closed the door. Then they thought of wood. They thought, and then they saw a most peculiar octagon-shaped building, low and with a cupola on top. They must see. Pause a moment. This is the building. <laughs> They, being city boys as it were, were a few years spent from the gentry of Louisville, came closer to this newest entrance. A full-size door reaching from the top of the low roof to the sill was opened, and there was a great round hole, all rumpled with straw, and then went swish, went a rabbit right between their little brown legs. Birds were flying about, spider webs hanging from the rafters. Having forgotten the rabbit scare, they climbed over the sill, and on closer examination, they saw a dampness down in the straw. And then there was a ladder and a pulley rope. They went down the ladder, the air becoming cool and sweet-smelling as they pushed aside the straw, saw great slabs of cloudy blue ice. But what was this thing of a thing sitting over by the rock wall on its two hind legs? The ladder swayed from side to side as they took off from their place, finish the fresh, warm air of that October day, bringing color back to their faces. The woodchuck minded not their intrusion. The boys went for the wood. Mammy, Mammy Mary had just opened her mouth to say, Eve and Tom hide themselves down to the garden and pull out those dead, ratted morning glory vines when a great commotion was heard coming from the front way. <coughs> By this time, the boys had circled the canna beds, jumped the flags, gulped the drink from the well, and were coming up the drive at full speed in a, what's a fight on them, too. Alfred Edward Chambers Sr. of Petersburg, who had agreed to carry the local students, collected each at their home and called a halt to Old Mount and Hank. Mont and Hank. Mr. Chambers' father, before the turn of the century, had been one of the advocates to have the state capital permanently located at Petersburg. This little town had grown rapidly, aided by river traffic, dry goods stores, Peters uh, drug store, grocery store, breeders of shorthorned cattle were just a few of the mercantile, mercantile assets. But this was not to be, and some 70 odd years had passed since the seat of government had long been established at Frankfurt. And, and showed the decline of his beloved bird. Mr. Cotton, who had been over at the classroom building, walked the hundred feet distance in quite a hurry. Four young ladies, all ruffled and fur belows, were alighting from the python. Delicate squeals, much prancing, high button shod feet, and uprooted student boys formed their game of four corner catch. Pandemonium set in. Trunks and bandboxes found their willing hands and in the very best manners helped from the rig, Mrs. Lee Hughes from Richwood, Laura Smith from Union, the Gadsden girls also from Union. A crushed position behind and under the boxes and trunks and a still a mystery of how he made the trip emerged the youngest, the youngest host of a journey, Alfred Edwin Chambers 
the second. If Norman looked down at the north pasture, saw the canes moving in the fishing pole thicket, he said he would just bet that Tom Baker was down there getting himself a fattest and strongest pole in the whole county. And he was. His sister Margaret was right in the thick of it too, and they were day students walking to and from school, lunch boxes in hand, laden with fried eggs between biscuit halves. Tom Baker was glad to be going home at night as, they, as this way with his pole and taut honeysuckle vine, he could get a spot of fishing in before night chores. Fowler Creek was loaded. Pigeons were cooing that evening a song as they neared the second veranda sailing, uh, second veranda railing. This pigeon pleasure was breaking Mammy Mary's disposition in little pieces. When Shelley and Roy called free from Tom to come and play them a tune on Mr. Cotton's banjo. This was just what Eve wanted to do. All summer evenings had been spent down by the river where they learned to sing and play the notes of Stevie Foster. Tom especially liked the one, Masses in the Cold, Cold Ground, and two, he liked the one about Old Country Never. Soon others gathered her ground, and the sun shines bright in my old Kentucky home. It was getting a good start, went up the drive, bundles dragging, dusty and rumpled, came of all people, just as Hudson and Elijah Hudson of Walton, Mose Allen of Normansburg, Ali Korn from Bulletsville, and Jimmy Johnson from Big Bone. Cries of, what happened? And you look like a hoorah's nest, were explained by all talking at once. But it was gathered that their horses had run off, dragging the buggy with him after first throwing them out. And it was all caused by Fielding Dickey's father's threshing machine. When, the, when they were riding past the Dickey farm, Fielding was chunking the boiler and let out a blast, and the crazy horse, not knowing this newfangled contraption was, took off. Plans were being made about what to do if Fielding on, on his arrival for classes. Darkness had now set in. Mammy Mary was touching the lamp's wicks with her own specially made lighters, when a scream was heard from the side of the road of the yard. They all ran to the door, and breathing as fast as their little legs would carry them was Jimmy Huey. He was so out of breath he could hardly speak, but they did not understand enough to know that the Federals were tearing up his hobby horse and chopping up Mose Allen's trunk. And Mr. Cotton interrupted and told the boys to come as he ran down the stairs down to the yard and took the shortcut through the fields. Mr. Joseph Addison Huey and his spouse Amanda Gaines Huey were pleased with, were pleading with the Union Army Home Guards to spare the belongings of the White Haven boys. Do whatever they wanted to do to, do to their things. With this, the guards became enraged and with axes chopped open the last trunk, taking clothing regardless of size on their way out of the house, snatching up a brooch on the mantel shelf. Years later, the same piece of jewelry was seen on the dress of a local citizen. The seriousness of this conflict was reaching home now. Mr. Cotton could no longer put to the back of his mind decisions that had to be made. Colonel J.J. <laughs> Landrum's federal forces of 600 men were nearing to cross the river south. It was in 1867 that Francis Mills French wrote, under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, love and tears for the blue, tears and love for the gray. Once more lilacs in the door bloomed and life again began anew as brother embraced Brethren, Mr. Tandy came to the academy followed by Mr. Stevenson and his brother, Nate Stevenson, and his wife. Mr. Nate was quite a favorite with the students, he teaching the younger boys and his wife and girl students. Mr. Tom, taught the older boys, was a rather nervous gentleman, quick-tempered, and hasty in his decisions. It was during one of his classes that one of the boys disobeyed his orders. He picked up a chair and struck the boy over the head. The hard feelings between the boy's family and the professor followed him. The boy's father, being influential in the community, caused the academy to be closed 
soon after this incident. And Professor Daughters, on one of his journeys to Salt Lick at Big Bone, noticed, decided this area needed the chance of an education since the common school district was yet to reach north the rural section of the state. He opened Daughters Academy at the Town Tavern, which is now the home of Leslie Barlow. All right, Francis, did you know? Uh, Professor Daughters did not gain the respect of the student body. Some of the boys thought they knew more than the professor. They would misconceive his assignments, and then when instructed to draw two parallel lines, they would draw them to meet at the end. It wasn't long before Professor Daughters decided Harrodsburg folks needed an education, so it is possible that where the now famous Beaumont Inn is located, the professor settled for round circles instead of crooked lines. A new way of life has now come to the Whitehaven. She was to become the hearthstone in the life of many, to be loved and return this affection. Families who crossed her threshold through the years were the Honorable Leonard and Jenny Kennedy Lassing. In 1872, Mr. Lassing represented Boone County at Frankfurt. Mrs. Lassing was the great-granddaughter of Thomas Kennedy, who operated the ferry in Covington, where later the suspension bridge was erected. Their daughter, Miss Therese Lassing, was an accomplished artist. Mr. Sam Hicks, C. Hicks, and his wife, Sally Kennedy Hicks, and their family of four lived there. Mr. Hicks was a merchant and farmer. <clears throat> the Abernathy family, followed by the partnership of Duncan and Coates, sold to Mr. J. Lem Lassing, the cashier at the Union Deposit Bank. Daniel Free Sr. and Jr. bought it for Mr. Frazier. They were industrialists in Covington. Civil strife, glo two global wars, the Oriental incident, a restless peace, and vapor from a fading jet bring us a long way from the dusty stage and forward. But Whitehaven lives on, more strong than ever under the tutorship of S.D. Edwards, more affectionately known as Doc, Doc. Where in years past nature had been most unkind Grasses now grow in lush abundance. Herds of cows and their young brows where Eve and Tom learn the meaning of freedom and equality. The slate with the love you, Joe, has long been laid away. The hickory stick and arithmetic, symbols of another day. Sound are the rep lark and raven. Godspeed. Dear White Haven, my mother did a great job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, she mentions things in there uh, that we can invent. Did, did it, Francis, did you real, uh, know about Leslie Barlow's home at one time being used as a school for this dar d daughters? No. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, History that I was. Yeah. Um, my mother was so close to all of this, I'm not, uh, I can't verify historical fact with the, all she wrote. I just know she did a beautiful uh, story. Uh, but, uh, and it's such a shame that she gives, she feels like Whitehaven will survive <laughs> that Doc Edwards got rid of it. Uh, but again, it's so difficult to fault the mind train of thought 50 and 60 years ago, when we look so much to find, modernize our world, we are so anxious to move into picture windows or ranch houses and, and fast cars and airplanes and, oh boy, and uh, now some of us who can remember the days before those things might reflect with, with pleasure of what we've missed. In conclusion, I think the most authentic thing I can give you about Whitehaven, and how are we on time? Doing decently? Uh, and thank goodness that uh, Kathleen Kenny Wiley uh, did an assignment 
at New Haven School. Is that, uh, explain the paper that you did this interview, did you not, with Boss Jenny? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, when I was a senior in high school, um, the county put all the, the four schools' papers together. And so, anyhow, uh, my assignment was to uh, find out where the name New Haven came from. And so I went down the road <laughs> and interviewed uh, Dr. Huey's uh, grandfather. And so he wrote down uh, several pages. And I'm one of these people that keep scrapbooks. And so I um, kept this all these years. And uh, so it details about Whitehead. Thank you for doing that, Kevin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I too had the pleasure of boss, knowing Boss Jimmy Huey when I went to uh, the Baptist Church in Union as a youngster when Mr. Kearns would pick my brother and up and the Dones boys and all the other boys that really didn't want to go to Sunday school or church. <coughs> Mr. Kearns would pick us up. And Francis knows what I'm talking about. And, uh, and Boss Jimmy and Mrs. Huey. Uh, I kind of always felt like it was their church. Did you ever get that feeling? <laughs> it was their church. Uh, I, I'm so pleased that I got to know the man. Let me read to you his written, handwritten account of his knowledge and experience of Whitehaven. Old Whitehaven School, by request, I am jotting down a few things I remember about the school, which was a school as far as back as a hundred years. As a small boy, I learned much of this school from Leonard W. Lassing, Dr. H. C. Lassing, B. L. Dickerson, L. Lynn Frazier, L. C. Norman, and Elsie Norman. The term 1861-62, four young men boarded with my mother and father, who lived two miles away, attended Professor Cotton's school. It must have been quite a school from their account. There came, then came Professor Tandy. He was a minister at the Christian church. And as we were talking, the the preachers in those days, when the Presbyterian preacher was a teacher, the Baptist preacher was a teacher, <laughs> it seemed like the, the clergy of the community were also the school teachers of the community. I know little about his school. Following him came Professor Stevenson's family. Professor Tom taught the older girls. Professor Nat taught the older boys. Mrs. Nat taught the younger boys and girls. The school building, long since torn away, keep in mind, there were two buildings at the site. Uh, the size, and and the, the two buildings show up on the 83 Atlas. Uh, but this is the primary building. The uh, other building, I believe, burnt down, the other dormitory. The school building, long, long since torn away, was by the side of the larger residence, where the teachers and boarders lived. Pupils from far away as Georgetown attended the school. The boys and girls were not allowed to play together. The older girls and boys' rooms were in the front of the building with uh, a door in between. They recited together. The girls entered the building from the front and the boys from the side door. Mr. Stevenson taught the little ones in the back room. The lunch baskets were placed in her room. Lucky, the older boys who had a sister to lunch with in Professor Tom's room. Naturally, many glances and notes were exchanged. A, a cousin who stayed with us two terms, uh, two terms was quite an asset for me at the lunch hour. It would be needless to say, Mum was our middle name. There were quite a number of boarders. There was a stable for the horses of those who came from a distance. Some rode horseback as far as six miles over mud roads. Hoping this will give you a small idea of the old school, I am sincerely James A. Huey. So thank you, Kathleen, and, and uh, for in that interview, which you have preserved. Uh, let me mention, uh, any other things that might be pertinent to this. Uh, at some time, when I, I had so much pleasure in my youth of uh, going over and visiting Whitehaven and, and this, the octagonal ice house 
was such an interesting place to me. And mom, my mother did a good accounting of that. How you can always see a kind of groundhog in there. Uh, but and if you don't mind, I'm going to sit down for a moment. If uh, I, it's a shame that people today uh, have such almost no recollection of the ice houses that were on almost every major farm. Uh, there were two on our farm, uh, one by the Lassing House, which uh, my parents, where I grew up, and was purchased by my great-grandfather. Uh, and then one even down at Charlie Baker's house, the house where my wife and I lived for 20-some years. Now, uh, there are hardly any ice houses left. Uh, and because people today can't even comprehend of what it was like. Uh, there was one when we were hiking creeks, Jack, okay, at Long Branch you, and you, got, oh, you, a tremendous ice house. You can tell the difference because it got a drain in the bottom. That's right, okay. Ice houses were a signal it wasn't, it wasn't habitation. A well. It wasn't a well because it had a drain in the bottom. And right now, they have found this ice house yeah. out it's on the Garrison property at Central Park, and I talked to Matt Becker and said, be sure to save that. It's a nice house. Oh, I think it was a sister. No. I said, that's no sister. That was a nice house. Um, and the, the, that's what we would discover. Root cellars and ice houses told us there was at one time somebody lived at that spot. Right. That, and we would find he's and going up. That's a pile of rocks where the chimney was. That's right. <laughs> when we explored the creeks of Boone County, which it would be a good program for Jack and Asa to put on sometime because I think he's got slides up. Be that well, with, without you, we wouldn't have found it. Come on well, now. Well, we lived out the 83 Act. Well, all you had to do is go up to the farmer's door, fake it on, and say, hey, my Bruce Ferguson, doors open. If I say posted or no trespassing or violators will yeah. or trespassing. Well, the power of the power the power of the door prevailed. Uh, yeah. That's when, that's when uh, yeah. you could find a Democrat in Boone County. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how, how many can wander around up and down the creeks over private property, six or eight guys, and not have any questions raised about the, what they were doing? The attitude was different then, Jack. Yeah, we're talking 37 years ago. I know. Okay. Uh, people were different then. All right, uh, but ice houses, there should be a study made of what an important feature an ice house was to a rural America. And I mean, that's <laughs> but, you know, how they kept their milk, their cream, how they made ice cream. You think, how in the world did they make ice cream? And my mother used to always talk about it at my great-grandmother's house uh, uh, when, when they, in the summertime, uh, pulling the straw out of the rice tea. <laughs> but, but it's kind of difficult now to realize that was a major business on the farm in the winter time was to make ice. And that's yeah, ice saws. Yeah. You, can, you can every now and then in an antique shop you will find an ice saw. I must uh, inject a little humor here about uh, Scott Jack, my uncle. Scott always claimed that he was the man down under the water that pulled the saw back down. <laughs> the water. <laughs> but, but I, most of us today, yeah, and they took this, their ice out of Gunpowder Creek, out of Long Bridge Creek, out of Wolper Creek, out of all these creeks. That's what they, why well, you wouldn't dare, it wouldn't pass a biological, <laughs> radiological exam. <laughs> uh, or out of their farm ponds. Yeah. But every uh, and they don't freeze as often. Yeah, do they? and you know, I or can we still get that much freeze in a winter time anymore? I, I haven't seen that much freezing. So, uh, it's, but boy, I guess their winters were colder. I mean, does anybody no. want to comment on that subject? No, well, no, no. But they were able to harvest ice, and it was very important to them. It kept their uh, milk and 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 perishable products viable through hot weather. They cut it off the mill pond there and won't. Uh, uh, when? I mean, what do you have, there? I have nothing. 83, 90, 1890, oh, okay. long in there. Okay, all right. All right, just uh, a wonderful subject someone should pursue and convince Matt Becker, our historic preservation officer, that out there at Central Park on the Garrison property, that's not a cistern that they're going to bulldoze in because it's a hazard. It's an old ice cellar that should be preserved. They built, they built two of them in on the 
uh, Sally Garrison's Hicks on H.A. Hicks, is there on? Oh, the ones on my floor. They filled them up. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were a nuisance. Uh, yeah. who, who cares? What's that thing all on the ground? And, and you don't, you know, you never miss water until your well runs dry. <laughs> one, of, one of them was underneath of a shed. Yeah, well, they always built a shed yeah. over it. Yeah. They, they, they always had some kind of a structure yeah. over it. How many people here have recollections of the nice house? Yeah. Yeah. We had Spring House. Yeah. Pardon? Spring House. Not spring House. Spring House, spring house was not, that no. was to cool your milk and yeah, stuff. Spring. Yeah, if you were lucky yeah. enough, and most people, boy, that made prize property if you had a good spring. Yeah. And if you had a good spring, you built a spring house. And you would keep your milk stored in the side trough of the spring house. But the ice house was a separate, yeah, exactly. specific facility for storing ice. Uh, Bruce? Yes? Um, as I recall when I was a kid, I remember seeing some. They were very deep. And a lot of people, I mean, some of them were probably, oh, well, I'm going by my child's memory, 20 or 15 feet. feet deep. 15 feet was about your 15 feet. Yeah. Rock wall. And, Rock wall. wall. And you also saved your sawdust for insulation to put on top of the ice. Yeah. Yeah. Sawdust and straw. Yeah. Yeah. And straw. So please, if you get a chance, go out to Central Park and, and over there on the side opposite from the park entrance. But here, I've got to get on them. They want to fill it up because it's considered a hazard. And it, it, it could be. I mean, it, there's no fence or, and they might have a fence around it at the moment. Um, okay. Open for any other discussion of any. I, I, I've rambled with you well, and enjoyed doing it. As I was compiling information on my book, the Civil War in Boone County, the names that you just threw out like that was actually the basis for me to locate where these people were. You could mention names during the Whitehaven years from the 60s as we were largely an agrarian county that tended not to move much further than you could the other side of the fence. And you could name names like we'll say we'll say for instance Gaines. We're talking about Bulletsville, what have you in there. You talk about others, they were on Mudlick Creek. The names that you mentioned in there of Leonard Lassing, H. C. Lassing, and et cetera, et cetera, L. C. Norman, uh, were in the Union. Then Walton was a kind of a mixture because it was a railroad town and uh, even prior unto that uh, it was on the main expressway from Covington to Georgetown to Lexington to etc. So people moved in. Largely Walton was a merchant's town, not primarily agrarian. But the names that you mentioned here was so useful uh, that and other names to locate where to look for the muster rolls of the various soldiers, be they north or south, it didn't matter. But they were all a, a, kind of a commune in there, largely intermarried one with the other in that same area. So the names that you mentioned in there rang such a familiar bell to me. Um, I want to conclude with what William Conrad, this is our prepared, and it says, and this is the conclusion, opposite the old Elm Tree Place, of uh, which was my mother and father's home, Elm Tree Place, the most humongous Elm Tree on earth, was the key point. It was Elm Tree Place, Elm Tree Farm, until the Dutch Elm Disease took care of that. Opposite the Elm Tree Place was the aristocratic Whitehaven Academy. The original building vanished many years ago. Uh, the institution was founded by the Reverend W. A. White, who pastored the Richwood Presbyterian Church during the Civil War era. And the academy erected with subscriptions uh, from citizens of union and environment, environs. There were once dormitories for boy, both boys and girls when the school was flourishing. However, 
Like Morgan and Academy in Burlington, patronage waned and the land and buildings were sold to other interests. In the picture, which is this one here, is the 10 room frame building, back up for you, it, which was the girls' dormitory. Another building, 75 to 100 feet distance, was for boys. The latter caught fire and burned despite the efforts of a bucket brigade. The girls' dormitory was saved and remodeled in 1934 by a new owner who found it built of four befores and two before teens. That's Dan Freeze. Uh, a railing with pegs for saddles and was discovered, and he was told that when fashionable boarding school girls went horseback riding, the occasion was a beautiful sight. Scrapped into the glass window panes were the names of girl students of long ago. Louise. 1867, Wilhelmina, 1862. They were the names of young ladies receiving training in a strict, well-chaperoned atmosphere where, when young men were reluctant to hold a girl's hand. The names of several instructors are known uh, according to the Loder Library uh, Diary. Uh, boy, did I have fun going to the Loder Diary just this week. Professor John D. Brown and his wife had an academy in Petersburg in August of 1864. On May the 4th of 1865, they moved to Whitehaven near Union, and on the 21st, Bill Rogers joined them. Seven years later, Thomas H. Stevenson, <coughs> an instructor from Whitehaven, took charge of the Morgan Academy in Burlington. Two persons who attended Whitehaven Academy were Emma Rouse, and James Lynn Frazier, Emma Rouse, oh boy, uh, married to, of course, John Hero Lloyd, and her clasping hands with generations past. We couldn't live without it, could we, Mike? Yeah. It not a work of preservation. No. So she was, she attempted, in your family, I presume, correct? Or just in Sure. Um, and uh, the persons who attended were Emma Rouse and James Lynn Frazier. Miss Rouse married John Ura Lloyd and moved to Cincinnati. Mr. Frazier remained in Boone County and assisted in organizing the Union Deposit Bank when it opened for business in 1903. He was the first cashier. He later purchased Whitehaven property. The picture was made in 1930 when he owned it. In the 1930s, brought a new system era of public school system in Boone County. Almost a century had passed since the county has established the 26 one-room school districts. By 1881, there were 46, and through the consolidation and other reasons, the number dropped to 38 in 1907. Since that time, the number has dropped slowly until concrete highways appeared in the 1920s. Okay, now you're getting the story of the history of public school system in Boone County, which someone should do a paper <laughs> presentation <laughs> on the development of the public school system in Boone County. Uh, Let me interject. My grandfather, Merritt Jack, had a Beaver Lake Mercantile uh, store, kind of a general store in Beaver Lake. He, had, uh, he was very conscious of education. My mother attended the school there at Beaver Lake up to the eighth grade. Then she had to board for four years with Mr. John C. Benger in Walton to go to Walton High School. Her sister also did the same. My mother either rode or had a buggy to take her from Beaver Lake to Walton. When she rode, she put the buggy and the horse into John C. Chambers' uh, uh, livery stable there, which prior to that time was A.M. Edwards' uh, livery stable and embalming salon, I guess. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, that was the way that they got an education, by leaving the public schools, which furnish education, to the eighth grade. They had to go elsewhere to get to high school. But Shirley Gale, she was the first one that could attend New Haven, where you went to high school, she was the first one that didn't have to board in Walton, 
or other places to get a high school education. So we must be blessed by our educational system. Walton still is an independent school and one of the few around. But uh, nevertheless, I don't think us of today know the sacrifices that our parents made for an education. Witness the White House. It cost money. <laughs> I can add a little bit to your mother's story. Yes. Um, before they could go to high school, they had to go to Burlington and take a test. And I had my dad's, and he was about the same age as his mother. <laughs> and they're on three by five cards. And uh, it's, uh, it covers different subjects like grammar, history, geography, and so on. And their teachers in the eighth grade had prepared them for this test to be able to go to high school because not everybody, as Jack pointed out, went to high school. Oh, again, very interesting and uh, study in itself. Yes. Go ahead. Oh. When I, well, everybody knows I'm a New Haven graduate, not White Haven, New Haven. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, of course, I went to school there all 12 years of my life, and, but the only thing I remember about White Haven is that at what point did that original building disappear? Did that building that you had the picture of? Yeah. Oh, uh, th th this was taken in 1935. Okay, but there was a big white house there even in the 50s when I was in school. Was that? Yes, that was it. It, it yeah. came down to keep an eye. Doc Edwards bought it around 1950. Okay. And the Edwards family moved in, and that's where he grew, raised his chickens for his Doc Edwards. How many people remember Doc Edwards' chicken place? <laughs> well, I remember. Now, Irene Patrick who served tables at <laughs> Doc Edwards. So that, that's what I remembered as being White Haven Poultry Farm. That's right. And the Evanses, I guess, the they must, were tenant farmers, apparently. That's right. That's right. Because they were the tenants for Doc Edwards, were the Evans family. All of them. Okay. Cause that, but I don't remember it prior to it being anything prior to it becoming a poultry farm. That's right. Well, you're just a kid, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth? Ruth? Yes. Was that, that 80 acres that was mentioned there, did it go back away from 42? Yes. Would yes. it have butted to Scott Jack's property? To would which? It, would it have a butted Jack? Scott Jack's property. Oh, probably is. Yeah. Because well, that's that probably about where the yeah. dividing line would be. That, that's right. It, 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 that's about where it would have abutted. There was a lane that went through there where Carl Adams lived on that lane. Uh -huh. and you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Quite well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, that that doesn't exist anymore. You can see the remains of that road. But yes, that's where it went. I, heard, I, heard, I live out in the general area. I heard sometime that, that, that Scott Jack's property at one time went all the way to uh, Frogtown. Well, that was Garrison. We call it the, 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 the historian. Say again? Or Hicks. <laughs> it, 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 it was Hicks, Harvey Hicks. Harvey yeah. Hicks, he was a dealer in livestock yeah. and no, that, whatever You could do a study on that family. He started that, the first board oh, agency oh, in the oh, county of oh. Union. Okay. We're, yeah. we're, 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 Steve is running out of, uh, no, out of tape. Yes, we are. I'm Seven running out minutes. of tape. <laughs> I just want to say uh, it's been a pleasure to give this presentation. I'm going to sit down. Here's stuff that you want to look at. Thanks, Ruth Wade, for bringing this material that relates to uh, Mr. White, Reverend White, and to Kathleen for the, for the interview you did with Boss Jimmy Huey. A lot of people, Boss Jimmy Huey, well, who are you talking about? Well, it's, he's not, he, I'm not talking about little Jimmy Huey. I'm talking about Boss Jimmy Huey. <laughs> uh, the, the vernacular of the day. Uh, in Union 50 years ago. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'll accept your applause. <laughs>
let me stay so far. But thank you very much. That was right. very interesting. And thanks for the ideas because the executive board sits here every other month feeding our brains trying to think of programs that will interest our membership. And, and I keep asking the same question, but if you have an idea, and we've gotten some things tonight, please let one of the board members know what it is, and if we can find someone to do the research, we will put it on. With that, I'm going to declare the meeting adjourned, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Good.